All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by another John, John Stoy, who is in Atlanta, Georgia. How are you doing, John? Great. Fantastic today. Yeah, and I love that John, John apparently is the only, likely the only investment advisor you've ever met who has managed both a 3.5 billion who's managed about 3.5 billion and a sushi kitchen, which was harder. Uh, you know what? I'm going to definitely go with the sushi kitchen. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, John's career be began on wall street trading floor 25 years ago. And what we wanted to talk today about is how to sell by listening. And, uh, and I guess that's, I mean, most salespeople, a lot of salespeople have said, yes, yes, you know, listening is really important, but, um, but it's still something that people struggle with. I mean, because there's listening, listening operates on a number of different levels. And I think sometimes people only operate on the, on the most superficial one. Uh, that's very true. Um, and in the business that I'm in, financial advisory, uh, you, you just have to really understand what's driving people. Um, certainly, once you start a relationship with them, uh, in order to get them on the right path, but, but in, in order to even get that relationship going, uh, if you can't hear what their real problem is and, 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 and what that, you know, for lack of a better term, that pain point is, uh, if you can't hear it, you'll never, you'll never touch it. And I think, I mean, and, and particularly, you're, as you say, I mean, you're in financial advisory and, I, and often for a lot of people who aren't financial experts but need, you know, need the help, um, they're very you know, they feel very nervous and about talking to somebody because again, they're thinking, well, you're an expert and I'm going to look like a complete neophyte and probably doing all these things wrong. So maybe I'm not even going to open up to you immediately because I don't want to feel foolish. That's, that's exactly it. It's, it's a combination of, of apprehension um, and, and often, as you say, embarrassment. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, and so that's one of the things that, that I need to, I need to listen uh, to from a potential client is to see, you know, what, what, which, which one of those is it? Um, is it just, is it some sort of fear, fear that they've waited too long and then they don't want to, they waited so long that they figure there's no point. Um, mm. Or, or is it just, they think that somebody like me is going to jump down their throat. Maybe someone has before, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even a neighbor has. Uh, and, and, and those are the kinds of things that if I don't, if I don't know, what to avoid or, or what to uh, highlight uh, there. I'm not going to make any progress. Yeah. Because I mean, the typical, I mean, as adults, it's very easy for us to, to revert. It's like when you go to the dentist, right? I mean, when, I mean, most people, when they go to the dentist, you know, you immediately feel like a child again, you know, and you're going to be, you're going to be given out to because you haven't been like flossing like 5,000 times a day or whatever you're doing this. So, you know, uh, but I think that, that that translates into a lot of things. And as you say, when you come for, you know, financial advice or something, you know, you, you know people are a bit apprehensive or nervous that you're going to go, well, wow, you're, you're coming to me now? What have you been doing? Or, you know, you're just ridiculous with your money or you, you feel like it's going to be the dentist again. Right. Um, and, and oftentimes we're, we need to give them that, uh, that white space in order mm -hmm. for them to to tell you what, what they, they, they want to tell you. If, if they've reached out to you um, yeah. as, as any type of salesperson, but certainly as a, as a potential advisor, if they've, re if they've reached out to you, there is some level of, of interest, uh, yeah. but, but how do you get them to commit? Uh, and one of the things that I was thinking about before we, we uh, got on, the, on this meeting was one of the most important things, um, times that I'll talk to a person and then very, very purposefully listen and, and give them that space is um, when they want to know, you know, well, when should I start? Because mm -hmm. of, we all, we all know the, the old saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Yeah. The next best time is, is today. Well, mm -hmm. but, but how can I get somebody to, to, to see something like that um, in their lives, in their financial lives? And I'll, and I'll do that often with a little drawing and I'll just sketch out on a blank piece of paper. Uh, a, a box on the left, which is now, um, and then a box directly to the right of it across on the other side of the paper, which is the future. Um, and I'll draw a line 
that says an arrow from from now to the future and say okay well if if we do nothing this is probably the line we're going to be on um mm-hmm. and and how does your retirement potentially look look like in your mind if we do nothing um and they'll 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 give me some sort of sure. you know, answer, and then and then I'll say okay, well, but if we do nothing, most people don't go in a straight line; they they drift, and so they'll mm-hmm. often drift down. And so if I draw that line down, and I'll say okay, well, how does this what look if your if your if your financial position in the future is one two three times worse than that stasis point yeah. that you were hoping to get to, um, and then I'll draw a line up. And I'll put one at the top and say, okay, well, how, how would your retirement look like if you were actually improving uh, and we mm-hmm. were up here? Um, so which, which line would you, would you rather be yeah. on? And then, you know, do you see where it's the easiest point to get from one line to another is at the beginning? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and then I will literally, I'll literally stop speaking. And often the the answer or the, the the question that I'll get from a potential client is is well how do I get how do I get to that that upper yeah. line <laughs> when do we start Yeah, and I think one of the things important things that you outlined there is you know when you stop speaking um, here's the trap I think a lot of people fall into. So if you were to say have that conversation with me right now and then you you stop speaking, I'm probably not going to answer you immediately because I'm going to need a couple of moments to process it and think about it and, and whatever work through it. That silence is something that scares the heck out of a lot of, um, a lot of salespeople allowing that gap for processing. Yes. Oh, and, 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 and I am no expert and I still fall into that, into that mm-hmm. trap for sure. Um, because I was programmed for the first half or two thirds of my career, um, people essentially sold to me when I was investing money. Um, they wanted me very specifically to invest their money. I, I was part of a big, big firms and, and other people sold the firm. And then I was an important person, big, big, you know, big person that, that, that they were excited to talk to. Um, and my job was always to essentially show off my, my, amazing knowledge of the markets. I'm joking a little bit, but, but that's, that's, that was my, that was really my job. And so if I sat there quietly, then I wasn't selling to them as the, um, you know, sector expert that, that, that they thought they were engaging. So I had to really, and I still have to really, t- you know, flip that around to, to get that to work. Um, now my job is similar on one side. I still help manage funds for people, but I need to convince them. I need to be the person to convince them that it's worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And so, and so when they do start to, you know, um, work through and they start to uh, communicate with you, right. Um, then you have to obviously go down some more levels and, and expand it. So, I mean, you're at the end of the day is you want them to talk more and more, but you want them. So how do you get people to, expand upon their initial responses this is going to sound a little a little um simplistic but but i think Mm -hmm. sometimes that's the best um i think my most often used phrase is is okay tell me more Mm -hmm. about that uh you know if they they say they just want to uh sit on their porch uh and drink sweet tea uh when they retire Mm -hmm. but like that's well, that's fantastic. You know, t- tell me more. How would that look like uh, with with children or, or grandchildren, yeah. uh, et cetera? Right. And then let them, you know, fill in some more blanks because, um, you know, again, my job is is to is to try to help folks to 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 see that there's more to planning than simply dollars and cents. But, um, you know, the, all of us, we just want to. We don't want to imagine the difficulties. Um, mm-hmm. and sometimes we don't even want to let ourselves imagine the good things that could happen, uh, mm-hmm. if, if we do things right. So, uh, those are the, those are some of the openings that I want to give people. Otherwise, uh, I won't know what to talk to them about. You're right. Mm-hmm. 
And then how do you then go um, continue to build a trust foundation? Because I mean, particularly the kind of business that you're in, but it's true for most, uh, is it's trust is is a massive factor. And so so getting building that trust and, and showing that you can be trusted, how do you develop that? In the it's particularly in the early stages, right? I mean, it's later on it's easy if you're delivering, but in the early yeah. stages, there's some faith involved. Yeah. And and I think that circles right back to our, our topic, which is listening, because mm-hmm. I need to listen to, if I've heard what's important to them, if I've heard that, um, that their child is important to them, um, perhaps they have a special needs child, mm-hmm. uh, and I heard that, uh, and they didn't focus on it because it's maybe something that they're, again, maybe they're slightly embarrassed about. No reason mm-hmm. to be, but that could be something sure. that I've run into that people don't, aren't mm-hmm. comfortable talking about. But, if, but, but they will mention it. And, and then on further um, communication with them, I, I would bring that up. And if I were to look, have looked into some specific solutions that, that deal with something that I can see that is troubling them, that they didn't even really want to bring up. But, 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 but if you're listening correctly, you can tell that that's mm-hmm. a real touch point with them. Um, that's a big way uh, to do it. Uh, it, 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 you're right. It's, it's, it's just relationship building. Um, and if you don't listen to the other person and all you do is talk, you're not going to ever build a relationship. And I love that point though, because, um, what you're, what you're saying there about if you're really listening and you pick up on something that maybe is said kind of in passing, uh, but later on you come back to it and you show you actually dug into the research into it. For me, that's probably one of the greatest ways of demonstrating not just that you were listening, but a respect for the person to say, okay, it was important enough for you to mention it. Perhaps you didn't dwell on it, but it was obviously important enough for you to mention it. Um, and that kind of proves that there's this, that there's a greater level of listening, not just superficial listening going on. Yeah. And, and it's, it's super important. Um, I think, yeah, in my business, it's it's a lot of the nature of of the information is going to be personal that goes back and forth. But mm-hmm. I I often think of it just even in with car salesmen, you might say, uh, if somebody comes in and they they the salesman asks them a simple question, they say, "Well, I want the car to be red." Well, that's mm-hmm. fine. You can get any car that's red and go across yeah. the street. But there's something more than just the car, you, <laughs> you, right? The, and and so the salesman's going to have to find, somehow. Uh, tease out of, of the person. What's, what do they really want? The car, they, mm. they want it. They want to be able to roll the back window down without hearing that crazy buffeting sound. Uh, that, mm. that's so annoying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and it's interesting too, if you, if you, if you think about it as well, it, it, your point is like different people are different. I mean, obviously, and people can consume information differently and different things are, are important to them. So I guess also, by listening, you're also establishing what kind of person are they? Are they a highly, so for instance, if you're dealing with somebody who's highly, highly analytical, right? You're going to get into the minutia of this stuff. Um, if you're dealing with somebody who is more, likes to be at a high level, but is more focused on the the personal relationship and the trust building stuff, then you're going to present it differently. But you're not going to know that until you have allowed them to express their personality. No, and that and that is so true because we we can't really give everybody one of those uh, Myers Briggs or whatever type yeah. of test that that might uh, <laughs> that might yeah. indicate to us supposedly how we're supposed to communicate with the person. We need to be able to tease that out, as you say, uh, earlier on. And again, if all we do is spew out information at them uh, mm-hmm. about how great we are, how great whatever products we use uh, are. Um, that's not going to do anything to help that. Yeah. They can find that out on the, I'm sorry, I spoke over you, but they they can find that out on the internet. (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly. And I think, um, you know, the other part is like sometimes, as you said, sometimes if you take Myers-Briggs, right, there's four components to it. And sometimes those, um, those components of a personality only reveal themselves over time. So if you jump in too quickly and assume that, the dominant part of that that I'm expressing to you now is the whole of me, then you could be missing the mark in a big way. Mm -hmm. No, very, very true. Very true. So what Um, are, so what are some other ways that you can um, progress things? Okay. So, you know, you listen and you, you to build the trust. Um, There comes a, there's always that point in most sales cycles where everything is going well. And then, you know, 
the buyer maybe gets a little bit queasy, sort of, you know, is because just before they pull the trigger, you know, am I doing the right thing? So how how does um, communicating and listening help during that period? If I if I had to say, because you're ideally you're communicating mm-hmm. on a regular basis. Um, you whether you've got yourself calendar ticklers or whatever it is, you're 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 not letting things go too long. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you are doing that and and continually listening, uh, then hopefully you can try to anticipate some of these things. Um, if you hear that they're con- you might hear they're considering something else in their life uh, mm-hmm. and it may lead you to say, okay, well, you know, I, I, I heard you say something about your, your, your wife or, or your coworker. Um, you know, how's this still re- working out, you know, with us or what, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, yeah. It's hard to come up with a good example as sure. we're chatting here, but, but, but again, if we're just, if we suddenly make that, we think we've made a close and gotten a client for life. Um, it, you can, you can let them, you know, uh, you can let them fall uh, off the branch pretty easily if you don't keep fertilizing. Yeah. And I think the point as you're making is the underline everything we're talking about is the continually listening because there is sometimes we allow ourselves, I call it the happy ears syndrome is sometimes we just allow ourselves to hear everything positive and think everything is going in the right direction because we're not really analyzing and maybe there's the odd red flag here and there that if we explored we could probably mitigate fairly easily but we don't and it then it crops up later and kind of smacks us yeah no i think we that is a that's a key um i think psychological uh, crutch which is mm-hmm. that you'll you'll see as you say those those slight red flags, and then it's so easy to say to yourself, "Ooh, if I bring that up, that's going to yeah. remind them of what it is yeah. that's bothering them. Maybe if I don't bring it up, they'll forget about it." Yeah. But yeah. but um, they may forget about you <laughs> instead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they may just forget about it until the last second, and then they suddenly bring it up, and it turns out that it was a much bigger issue than mm-hmm. you anticipated so i think yeah so i think a lot of it uh, comes down to also is the courage to explore right and not to always worry is it just going to take things off track and to be honest if it takes things off track then there's a reason why things are going to go off track and and that red flag was going to be an issue at some stage yeah oh um that's huge it's especially huge i think in relationship businesses like mm-hmm. like like mine because um not every client is going to be a fit for every yeah. uh, professional, uh, and mm-hmm. that's okay. Uh, and I think that it's really difficult for people who are new to whatever business they're in um, to be able to say no to a client. Mm. But, but for me, and I, and I have to know that somebody's going to want, at least theoretically, want to work with me for a long period of time. Mm. Um, we're talking potentially decades, and yeah. and so. I am, I'm there to help them, but I'm there to relieve stress from their lives. Mm -hmm. But I'm also in relieving that stress. I'm, I'm not, I'm not there to take the stress upon myself instead. I'm not (laughs) transferring stress, right? I'm, I'm trying to relieve that stress. And so if a client is a certain type of client that, that is maybe not, um, not a good fit for me and, and they may be Mm -hmm. a good fit for another financial advisor uh, of a different ilk, um, they're eventually going to stress me out and yeah, that's yeah. going to make it difficult for me to do my job. So, so listening and, and trying to figure out again, whether, whether I really even do want to, to quote unquote, sell that client on my services. That's, that's super important for, for my business as well. Yeah, no, I think, and I think that's a really good point and I, and I really want people to take that away and it doesn't matter what kind of sales you're in is, is yes, your your job is to reduce the stress of the customer. Your job is not to take that stress upon yourself because that's not a win-win there. That's um, that you're you're going to lose in that scenario <laughs> exactly. in a big way. Uh, well, listen, John, this is great. Uh, John Stoy, Verbatim Financial is the company. Um, all of John's information is going to be in his contributor bio, but please do tell everybody a little bit more about yourself and what you do. 
Um, well, I am uh, a, a flat fee, uh, fee-only financial advisor. So what that means is I charge clients uh, one fee uh, for a financial, a financial plan if they want that. And then if they want ongoing financial advisory uh, and investment management, there's one other fee. It's not a, uh, it's not a scalable percentage of their mm -hmm. assets that I take uh, every month or every year like uh, some advisors do. And I feel very strongly that that's really the only way to be truly fiduciary, as people like to say, for your clients, which is to if agree upon a, a, a fee that they're happy with and that, that I'm happy with. Um, and that fee doesn't change because the work doesn't change because the market went up or they inherited some money or, or something like that. So that's a, for, for me, that's a, that's something I feel, you know, very keen about. And, and that's what I like to uh, basically get, get my, my clients to understand as well, that, that you can get good financial advice without giving away a percentage of your, of, of your uh, retirement every year. Yeah, yeah. Which obviously, I mean, when it is, when it is kind of variable and all of that, that, you know, there's some, inherent maybe little inherent conflicts built into that um there sure are uh, <laughs> uh the, the, there are there are conflicts of interest uh the, the financial services world sadly is rife with conflicts of interest uh be it commission um or even under the fee only rubric um if you are compensated by a percentage of your client's assets under management then you may have a conflict uh in terms of um recommending that they get rid of some of their money to buy say a piece of property or whatever mm -hmm. they want. <laughs> and so, so the, the only way really in my mind to, to assure yourself that, uh, that, that your advisor, your professional on the other side um, is, is only acting your interest is, is to know exactly how they're getting paid, how much they're getting paid and, and why you're paying them. Yeah. And, and I love it. And uh, verbatimfinancial.com is the website. And you can see you said your, your grandfather had a saying that your mom never let you forget as a child, you do the right, you do things the right way, or you don't do them at all. And I think that's a, that's a great way to, to end this. Um, listen, John, thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Golden from SaaSpop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, CEO for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah.